Pray with me, will you? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we come to you now, Lord. We come to break the bread of life. We come to share that which you have given unto us. You told us that every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, we are commanded and we are, we are to live by it. So, Father, I covet your anointing right now. I pray, Lord, that our, your word this morning would go forth with power, authority. Oh, Lord, will we'll, we'll, we'll strengthen some soul, will bring someone to that place of understanding, oh, God. We give you the thanks for all that you will say and do in the name of Jesus Christ. And our people believed with me and said, Amen, Amen. All right, allow me to set the backdrop for this message this morning. Jesus, Jesus is making his way toward Calvary. But before he gets there, he must deal with the sinful, sinfulness of, of the nation of Israel. And just before these the events, in fact, the very day before, he had gone into the temple and created quite a controversy. He had cleansed the temple, driving out the people who were profaning the house of God by buying and selling in its courts. And we see this in the previous chapter, in chapter 15. And this event had caused the religious leaders who had profited from, from the activities, from the business that was being carried on in the temple. It offended them, and they were looking for a way to destroy him. And today, this day now, Jesus is back in the temple, and these men see a chance to discredit him. It seems that they have regained their composure from their apparent defeat the day before, and now they come to him, and, and they are seeking to discredit him. And they are asking him, who do you think you are? And what right do you have to come here and undo all that we have done? It is a clear attempt to discredit Jesus in the eyes of the people. But Jesus will not be trapped. And he turns the table on them. He asks them a question. He said, I'm going to ask you a question. Tell me, who do you think John the Baptist was? And who do you, do, do you, uh, 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 do you, Accept his message and his ministry. See, under whose power was John the Baptist operating? See, Jesus knew. He, 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 didn't, he wasn't unsure of it. He knew what power John the Baptist operated on. He was operating in the same power, the power of God. And he knew that they couldn't answer him. In fact, they taught within themselves. So the, so the scripture tells us. They reasoned within themselves. If we say that uh, John the Baptist a message was from God, then the people is going to say, well, why didn't you believe him? And if we say he was not a prophet, then we would, they will say also they will come against us because they all accepted that John the Baptist was a prophet. So he turns the tables on them, and so they decide, well, we don't have an answer for you. And Jesus says to them, okay, then I wouldn't give you an answer either. Now, he could have left it right there. But he took the time he was going to rebuke them for their, their sinfulness and their refusal to believe. And in the parable, he tells them a parable. And in that parable, Jesus not only exposes their sinfulness, but he also exalts the majesty of God. I want you to read with me now. Mark chapter 12 starts at verse 1. And he began to speak unto them by parables. And he said, A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge about it and digged a place for the wine vat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent unto them another servant, and at, and at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and, they, and him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also unto them. He sent them the last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. 
But those husbandmen said unto themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Verse 9. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. Now, rather than concentrate on the, sinful, the sinfulness of the, of, the, of the Jewish leaders, I want us to look into this parable and I want us to see the Lord of the vineyard. I want us to see the Lord of the vineyard in his goodness, in his grace, and in his glory. And you see, the main truth I want to drive home today is this. That those who reject the grace of God will eventually have to face the wrath of God. We see that in the scripture. If you reject the grace of God, you will eventually have to face the wrath of God. And with that in mind, I want you to notice the Lord of the vineyard as, as he is revealed in this parable. In verse 1, it describes a man who planted a vineyard. He built a hedge around it to keep the wild animals out. He dug a depression or a, a wine vat, a place for the wine, to collect the juice that would be harvested from the grapes grown in the vineyard. He built a tower so that the watchman might be able to keep watch, diligent eye over the vineyard so that it can be protected. And he placed the vineyard in the hands of men assigned to it. And then he left it in, this, in their care. This parable is a parable. It's a parallel to one we see in Isaiah chapter 5. Where God is speaking about the nation of Israel and comparing them to a vine. You see, in this parable, Jesus is rehearsing for them what was said in Isaiah chapter 5. And in this parable, the Lord of the vineyard is God. The vineyard is Israel. The husbandmen are the Jewish religious leaders. The servants are the prophets God sent to Israel. And the well-beloved only son of the Lord of the vineyard is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is presenting himself to them. And he is re, 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 regurgitating that parable in Isaiah 5. Right before them. So that he, they can understand what he is about to say to them. And with this in mind. It is clear to see that verse 1 here. Refers to the goodness of God. The goodness of God toward Israel. The nation of Israel was often pictured as a vine. Isaiah made that clear, abundantly clear. In fact, we need to, I want you to get the, a, a feel for what was happening here. Jesus is standing in the court of the Gentiles and he's addressing these Jewish leaders who have come to him to question him. And on the right side, behind his one shoulder, there is the vineyards of Israel laden with grape trees and vines. And on the other side is the temple wall. And on that temple wall was an engraving of a magnificent grapevine with leaves of, of silver and gold and, and grapes made of jewels. And he, so he was saying this to these people so that they could understand what he was talking about. He was making a live reference to the vineyard. And oftentimes, wealthy Jews, those who had money, would come and they would make contributions to the temple. And those that contributions would be taken and they would be used to, to create another jewel to hang on that, on, that, on that vineyard there. So they were well aware of what he was saying. And the Jewish leaders have no doubt about what Jesus is talking about in this parable. He's talking about the nation of Israel. God had tenderly raised up the vine that is called Israel in a land called Egypt. Then he had taken that vine and transported it across the burning sands of the Sinai. And he had planted them in the land of Canaan. I want you to get the understanding of what Jesus is saying here. Then he took, there the nation took root and it flourished. God had given his vine a good land. 
in which to grow. He had given it his word. He had given it his protection. And by God's own testimony, he had done everything he could have done to ensure the success of the vine called Israel. In fact, in, in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, he questioned, What could I have done more for my vineyard that I had not done? And in spite of God's goodness and love to Israel, they had never returned that love to him. Wherefore, he said in verse 5, verse 4 of chapter 5, Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth good grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. Still, God continued to care for his vine to bless his vine, to protect his vine, to dress his vine. And in spite of their waywardness, Israel was forced to concede the goodness of God. The psalmist himself would say, truly, God is good to Israel. <laughs> Hallelujah. And there is no question that every saved person in this house today has at some time have to confess that God has been good to us. Amen. God has been good to us. We are not Israel, but there is a day when God came to us in our Egypt. He dug us up in our roots and he transplanted us into a new country. In a new kingdom. And we are reminded in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our trespasses. We were children of disobedience. We were living in lust. Fulfilling the way of our lustly desires. We were children of wrath. But God, holy Lord. But God in his mercy and in his love saved us. Hallelujah. He raised us up. And he seated us together with Christ. We who were without God in this world, we who were without hope, we who were aliens and strangers to the promises of God, now we are in Christ with God. Hallelujah. God has been good to us. And we are reminded in Colossians chapter 1 that we have been made partakers of the inheritance of the saints. That we have been delivered from the power of darkness. That we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. That we have redemption through his blood. That we have forgiveness of sins. Oh, praise the Lord. We are the people of an eternal kingdom of God with an eternal promise of life. Hallelujah. God has been good to us. Praise the Lord. Surely he has been good to us. Add to our salvation all of the blessings he has given to us. <laughs> Add to all of that all the prayers that he has answered. Add to that the fact that he is ever with us. Amen. That he eternally loves us. That he meets our needs. And 10,000 other truths. And we must confess that God is indeed good to his people. Amen. God is good. But isn't it also good that God is good to those who don't even know him or love him? Just think about this. Consider the earth that he has given all people to enjoy. Consider the food and the water he gives to all people to nourish their bodies. Consider the air he gives to all people to breathe. Consider the fact that he allows people who despise him and reject him and hate him to keep on living right on the right side of the dirt. Consider the fact that if you are not saved today, you are still not in hell. Yeah? Consider, consider these things and at least acknowledge that God is good to all people. Amen. God is indeed good. And if he is indeed good, then he deserves to be praised by all creatures. No doubt the psalmist said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Praise the Lord that he is good to you and I. Amen. Praise the Lord. And having planted the vineyard and having done everything necessary for the vineyard to succeed, the Lord of the vineyard sent his slaves to gather the profit, the profits of his land. You see, it was common in, common in those days that to allow the sharecroppers to farm the land and to get a percentage of the increase. 
And the owner usually would receive one third to one half. And the farmers, they got the rest. And when this landowner sent his slaves, they were cruelly mistreated by the farmers. Verse 3 said the first one was beaten. Verse 4 said the next one was stoned and wounded in the head. Verse 5 says the next one was killed. And after that, the landowner sent a steady stream of his servants to get his profit. And they were all either beaten or murdered or men they, by the men who he trusted with his vineyard. And after all the servants had been destroyed, the landowner sent his only son in verse 6. But just as they had destroyed all of the others, the previous people that came, the servants of the land of the, the Lord of the vineyard, they thought that they were going to kill him also. They believed that by killing the son, they could claim the vineyard for themselves. Hear what they says: Come, this is the son. Let us kill him so we can claim the inheritance. And this section of the parable is designed to speak to the religious leaders of Israel. You see, they had been entrusted with the spiritual well-being of the nation. And time and time again, they had led the nation astray. And God in his infinite grace sent judges and prophets and other holy men to lead them back to the right path. And each time God sent a man or a prophet, they, they will not hear his message. They beat him. They rejected him. They killed him. Some were beaten. Some were killed. But all were sent away empty-handed. Israel rejected prophet after prophet, culminating in John the Baptist. Yet God kept on sending them his men and his message. What grace. Hallelujah. What grace. And the truth, the same is true today. God has given us witness after witness in an effort to call his people back unto himself. God is constantly calling. God's witness to us is all around us. The psalmist says, the heavens declare his glory. And the firmament is full of short-handed handiwork. God's witness in the world around us leaves all of us without any excuse. We cannot say that we don't know God that God, or we cannot see God. Romans 1 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen and being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Hallelujah. God's witness is within us. Romans 2 tells us that the God has written his law in our hearts. Man is without excuse. Why does God still, why does he still call wayward people to come to him? Why does he still reach out to them in an effort to get them saved? He does it because he is God. And he's a God of infinite love. Of infinite grace and infinite mercy. He does it because he desires the salvation of sinners more than he does their judgment in hell. God does it so that you and I might have a chance to be saved from our sins. He does it so that your loved ones might have an opportunity to get into the kingdom of heaven. And don't miss this. But those husbandmen in verse 7 said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. These Jewish leaders thought by killing the son, they could have the vineyard for themselves. These religious men would never have admitted it, but they wanted to be their own God. They wanted to run the show. They wanted everything for themselves. They wanted the wealth, the glory, the power. And they did not want to share it with anyone. Especially if that person was an uneducated carpenter without a pedigree from Nazareth. They could not stand the thoughts of acknowledging Jesus as Messiah and God. And what they failed to understand is what many people today fail to understand too. You see, when you get the sun, you get the vineyard also. Hallelujah. You get the vineyard and you get everything in it. When you get the son, you become a child of God. When you get the son, you become a joint heir with the prince of heaven. When you get the son, you get all the blessings of heaven with it. When you have Jesus, you have everything. You have abundant life here and you have eternal life in heaven. 
You get everything. And they did not understand it. And so many today do not understand that. Jesus is everything. And when you have him, you have life. All these things are the products of God's grace and patience. And if we got what we deserve, we would be dead and in hell today. But we are not dead. And we are not in hell. We are alive. We are on the right side of the dirt. We are still breathing God's air and still enjoying God's blessing. We are still partakers of God's grace today. What grace that he would even call us to be his children. What an amazing grace that he would keep seeking and keep calling and keep loving and keep drawing until we come to him. Praise God for his grace. Hallelujah. He is a gracious God. Constantly extending grace unto us. He's our only hope. First John 5, 12 will say, He that hath the Son hath life. And he, had, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. John 14, verse 6 said, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man will come unto my Father but through me. If you are saved today, child of God, develop an attitude of gratitude this morning. This is a new year. If we are going to send the light, we need to have the light. And we need to let that light shine. A light of grace, a light of mercy, a light of goodness. We need to demonstrate to the world what God is doing in us, through us, and for us. We ought to show the world God's grace and God's mercy and God's goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse 9 and 12, we see God, the Lord of the vineyard in his glory. Hallelujah. The Lord of the vineyard is left with no choice. He has tried to work with the farmers time and time again, but they refuse to listen to him. And now because they have rejected his slaves and killed his son, he will come and destroy, come in rot. He's going to come in rot, church. And he's going to destroy those who have taken what is his. Hallelujah. And so it, it was with the leaders of Israel. They had rejected every attempt God had made to call them back to himself. They even abused and killed his messengers. Even John the Baptist, the servant of God, most recently sent to them, was rejected and beheaded. Now they have determined in their hearts that they were going to destroy the very son of God. Jesus had demonstrated his, de his deity and his identity to the Jews in many ways and in many occasions and through many miracles. His miracles and his message all cried out to them that he was the son of God indeed. Yet these men wanted the vineyard for themselves and they were willing to kill their master, to kill the Messiah to get it. And kill him they did. And they pushed him to Calvary. And there they crucified the Son of God. They literally took the Son of God out of the city and murdered him there. Jesus was God's final messenger. When they rejected him, they were saying no to God for the very last time. There was nothing left for them but judgment. And that judgment came in just a few short years. Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was torn down. The Jews rejected God and his son and they paid a terribly high price for that decision. Because they rejected the God of grace, they were going to be forced to face the God of wrath. The same is true today, church. Jesus is God's last word to humanity. And if we reject him, we would have no more hope of salvation. Here is what you and I need to know. One day, we will stand before Christ. And we will either face him as savior, or we're going to face him as judge. Romans 11.22 is an interesting verse. It says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On one hand, God is good to those that come to him in faith. He forgives them. He saves them and he gives them everlasting life in heaven. Romans 10 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. On one hand, he is good. 
On the other hand, those who reject him will face him in punishment, will face him in judgment. Read Revelation 20. God, the Jesus speaking of the white throne judgment, and he's saying what will happen to those who rejected God, who rejected his son. You see, you will either face the lamb, face the lamb or you're going to face a lion. Hallelujah. Oh, we remember him as a meek and mild savior. But I'm telling you, when he's coming back to judge, he's coming back as a lion. The lion of Judah is coming back. And he is coming back with a flaming sword in his hand to render judgment to the unbelievers and the enemies of God and his kingdom and his church. Amen. Hallelujah. The choice is ours. You see, the greatest sin is not that a person can commit. It is not rape. It's not molestation of some child. It's not murder. The greatest sin a person can commit is to enjoy all the good things God has to have offer, to presume upon his grace, and then to reject his son. We enjoy the goodness of, gra- of God and his grace and his mercy every day. And there are those who are living every day, breathing, enjoying God's goodness, enjoying his protection and his provision, but rejecting him. And I'm saying to you, that's the greatest sin a person can, can, can commit, to reject the Son of God. And whether you know it, you and I are guilty. It was you and I and our sins that put Jesus on the cross. We are guilty of rejecting and killing the Son of God. And we will either repent of our sins and be saved, or we will be facing Him in judgment one day. God will be glorified one way or the other. In verses 10, he, Jesus changes the scene here. He changes the scenery. Uh, he says, and have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the cornerstone. He stops talking about a vineyard. He starts to talk about a building. He quotes Psalm 118 to make his point. He says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head stone of the corner. You see, the key to a good foundation to ensure that a building is going to be plumb and square is a cornerstone. And that stone, if it is straight, it's going to ensure that the building will be plumb and square. And if the stone is not right, the building will not be right. These Jewish leaders looked at Jesus and decided that he was not fit to be a cornerstone. In their eyes, he did not have the right pedigree. He did not have the right education. He did not have the right credentials. Jesus simply did not fit their expectations. And there are many in the world today like that. Why did they hate him? They hated him because his holiness and his words are that exposed their sins. They were left with no choice but either to repent or retaliate. And they choose to retaliate. And they condemned Jesus to die. And Jesus told them, the stone that you have rejected has become the head of the corner. You see, God ignored their assessment of his son. And instead, he set him as the cornerstone. They thought that they were getting rid of the problem when they put Jesus to death. In truth, they were signing their own death warrants. God would get glory one way or the other. Through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Matthew's account of this parable, he added this verse. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Uh, But on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. That is what it comes down to, church. Either you will fall on Jesus and be broken in conviction and repentance and get salvation. Or he will fall on you and crush you to powder. Explain the scripture. Hallelujah. Those who reject the mercy and the goodness and the grace of God is going to face a God of wrath. Hallelujah. Maybe this is not a good message to start off the year. But I thought, oh Lord, I want my heart to be set straight. I want to bring your people into a place of reality. You see, we have been preaching a a, a 
to this generation a gospel of evil, uh, of, of easy believism. We tell them all you have to do is say a prayer and to make a commitment. And we fail to tell them that God demands along with faith and repentance, obedience. <laughs> Hallelujah. God demands and he commands obedience. And he has given us his word and an example. So let me bring this to a conclusion here. When Jesus finished the parable, the Jews wanted to arrest him. But they, they wanted to deal with him right there. But they were afraid because the people, because the people respected Jesus as a great rabbi. However, the Jewish leaders hated him and they wanted him dead. They were confirmed in their rejection of Jesus and God was confirmed in his judgment of them. They made their choice and they would have to live with the consequences and the same is true for our lives. It is clear to see the goodness of God. It is all around us. Every day, God proves his love and his goodness through the precious gifts he gives us. His goodness should be an encouragement to us. In fact, Paul in Romans 2 says, Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance? Do you take the goodness of God for in vain? Do you not know that God's goodness and his forbearance with you and with your sin is what's supposed to lead you to repentance? Hallelujah. It is also clear to see the grace of God in our lives. He has given us opportunity after opportunity to repent and to come to Jesus. He has kept you out of hell another day. This should make you want to come to Jesus right away. Hallelujah. Think about the fact that one day God will get glory whether you are in heaven or in hell. One way or the other, he is going to get his glory. Amen. He will be glorified whether you join him in heaven or he will be glorified whether you confirm his righteousness by rejecting him and ending up in hell. Your choice. The choice is ours today. He is offering us a chance to have all our sins forgiven. He is offering us an opportunity to avoid hell and make heaven our eternal home. And may I say to you, child of God, if he is calling you, don't delay. You see, all of us here maybe think, may think that we are saved. But this message is also going to be going out to the public later this evening or tomorrow. So we are speaking evangelistically to people outside there also. You need to come to Jesus. Whoever you are, whatever comfort you think you are living in, if you are not a child of God, then you are going to hell. And if you don't take the word of God and, 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 and apply it to your lives, you will have to give an account one day. If you are saved, maybe like I said, you should develop an attitude of gratitude. And this year, let us thank him for his goodness. Would you stand with me? Let us thank him for his grace. Let, let us offer him our lives. Let us live to shine the light that he has so put inside of us. Let us show the world that our God is good and gracious and merciful. Let us show, us, show them that he is patient and long-suffering and waiting for them to come unto him. For he desires not that they, they suffer in hell, but that they live eternally with him in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gracious Father, we are so grateful to you thankful for your word thankful for your reminder thankful for the goodness that you have given unto us your mercy your grace extended to us every day we are thankful to you Lord and we want to live like people who are grateful and thankful we want to start off this new year Lord 
appropriating your word into our hearts and into our lives. Even as you have written it into our hearts, Father, help us to let it come out and flow out. Flow out in abundance. Flow out an example of what you are doing inside of us. May we live this life. May we be a people that is obedient to you, Lord. Obedient to your call and your commands. Obedient to you in all that you have done and given unto us. We pray for this people. I pray for this people, Lord. I pray that every heart, every life under the sound of my voice who have heard this word today will apply it to their hearts and to their lives. Oh, may we all rise up as one body looking to glorify your name, to make known your goodness and mercy and grace, to tell of your, to tell of the congregation, to tell the world that our Lord is good and gracious and merciful. May we be that kind of people in 2023, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor and glory. And the people of God believed with me and said, Amen, Amen, Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for listening. And Happy New Year one more time. You're my God. You're all together loving. All together worthy. All together. Jesus, help us not to reject you, Lord God. I feel like after a word like that, the Spirit commands a response. Oh, Jesus, help us not to reject you. Oh, Father, help us, God. Help us, God. Help us to walk in obedience, Lord. Bring your people unto yourself. Bring your people unto yourself to worship. Oh, if you just need to come forward and confess some things, if you need to come forward and get a touch of what that feels like, what that tastes like, oh, would you just come? Oh, Father, help us to find the goodness of God in everything, Lord Jesus. Help us to remember that when the hands, when we put what we have, when we put the vineyard in the hands of Jesus Christ, it becomes ours too, Lord God. Because you're going to get the glory. So we lift you up, Lord Jesus, and we give you the glory now with everything that's inside of us. That you would set our hearts straight to see you clearly, Lord God. Give, give, make some credit for being a channel to guide us through this year. 
to be concerned about the vineyard and the Lord of the vineyard and make sure that he gets the glory. Thank you, Jesus.